Ready or Not is probably the scariest non-horror game that I've ever played. And I'd say that most of the player base can probably agree with me on that. While its atmosphere is incredibly dark and the story delves into some really horrific subject matter, I don't think it ever explicitly goes out of its way to try and scare you. The game is unsettling, yes, but I think that it lacks the intentions that you need for it to be a horror game. Which makes it all the more impressive because if you've ever sat down and played Ready or Not, it's horrifying. The amount of times that I've been jump scared in this game are too many to count. So I thought that today it'd be sort of interesting to talk about the mission that most players think is the scariest. And I do just want to quickly preface this because there will undoubtedly be someone in the comments who tries to say this, but here I'm talking about scary in a more conventional sense. I think that we can all agree that the mass shooting and exploitation maps are really unsettling, but based solely on appearances, they don't really have that horror element to them. But this map does. So without further ado, let's cut this chatter and talk about Twisted Nerve. We're initially told in our briefing that one of the previous arrests that we've made has led us to investigating a potential meth lab. One of the men that we arrested at the 4U gas station had a note in his pocket that mentioned this place. It seems that he was likely going to use whatever money he got from the robbery to purchase meth here. In addition to this, a few days ago, police encountered an injured man on the side of the road who at first was thought to be a hit and run victim. However, after interviewing the man, a very different truth began to present itself. The man admitted to police that he was a runner for a local gang and that the group had been operating out of an abandoned property nearby. And on this property, the gang had been producing and storing large quantities of methamphetamine. Now this witness, thinking that he could make a quick buck, tried to steal some of the money from this stash house, but the gang captured him. They took him to the house's attic and tortured him. And assuming that they had already killed him, they dumped his body off on the side of the road and left him for dead. Now that he's in the hospital though, the man provides us with all of the information that we need to know. And with that, we can close our briefing and begin the mission. Now, when we arrive, we spawn in a fair distance away from the house. So we actually have a little bit of time to look around before things start getting too hectic. And the first thing that we'll see here is that there are trash bags everywhere, which if you can remember, is a callback to the first mission. Through this little detail, we can see that the garbage workers are still on strike. And it seems that the results of this are even more pronounced in the lower income parts of the city. Furthermore, we can see a couple of the Banco protest signs lying around, which would suggest that that conflict hasn't been sorted out either. So more or less, if you don't really know what I'm talking about here, all that this stuff is really telling us is that Los Suenos is still a massive pile of shit. And with that detail out of the way, we can begin to make our way towards the property. Now to me, this map is really cool, right? Because while we only have the one infiltration point, there are a ton of different directions that we can take once we start making our way up towards the house. For this being the third mission of the game, the map is deceptively large. So for the sake of filming this video, I'm going to go with what I think to be the most popular route. As we work our way up the stairs, we'll make our way through a small garage and after this, we'll find ourselves in the front yard of 213 Park Homes. When we make entry, we'll likely find ourselves having to use force to pacify some of the occupants. Now, in my playing of the level, 9 times out of 10, I got into a gunfight as soon as I opened the door, so we really do need to proceed with caution. Once enemies in this section are dealt with, though, we can begin to look around and investigate. The first thing that we notice is the absolutely abysmal state that the house is in. I mean, believe me, I've heard of crack houses, right? I mean, we all have, but this one sort of takes it to the next level. Aside from this though, there are a lot of other details that we need to process here. In the kitchen, we'll find several barrels and containers filled with chemicals, suggesting that this particular area might be where some of the producers cook their meth. Now, on the opposite side of this room, we can find a hallway that has a very rough looking bathroom, as well as two different bedrooms. Now, I searched both of the bedrooms to see if I could find any details that could help us along in this mission. And while I couldn't find any here, I do find it worth mentioning the absolutely horrible condition that these people have been living in. Many of the addicts are sleeping on the floor, or at best on bare mattresses, and rooms flooded with trash, bugs, and all sorts of 
awful things. To put it simply, these people are as about as rock bottom as rock bottom can get. So for that reason, I've decided to try and keep this run as non-lethal as I could. On the opposite side of the house, we can search the living room, where we'll find a smashed TV, some furniture, and some really creepy drawings pasted over the walls. One of these drawings seems to depict a blank face with its head split open, while the other just shows a regular skull. Moving past this though, we can see a small hallway, which leads into a laundry room and some other small areas. But none of these really had anything worth mentioning. The only thing that I could find that was of any interest was a magazine talking about the crisis in Yemen. Below the headline, it reads, War in Yemen is becoming more likely as the United States Air Force continues surgical strikes. Now, this magazine right here is in reference to a mass shooting that we'll see later in the game, as a terrorist group from Yemen shoots up a downtown nightclub in response to the US airstrikes that we see mentioned here. And if any of you guys are interested in that, I've already made a video on the Neon Nightclub level, so by all means, please go check that out. But anyways, with that, we've now cleared the entire first floor, and we can make our way upstairs. The first door we enter is another bedroom, except this time we can see some phrases painted out across the wall. The primary one being, where drain is, dig. Behind this writing we can see yet another phrase, which appears to be written in Spanish. Unfortunately though, I couldn't really make out all of the words since some of them were blocked, so I was unable to translate it. Underneath of the wall writing, we can also find a couple more of those eerie drawings that we saw earlier. One depicts a giant bug, and the other three show a perspective of someone looking through a tunnel. One of these drawings says, I see it, follow the insect. And another says, dig, dig, dig. We are close. Sitting next to all of this are several shovels, sledgehammers, and other bits of mining and digging equipment. So it would seem that whoever is living here is going to go dig a tunnel to try and find an insect of some sort. It's kind of hard to make out since you know this is meth logic, but currently this is what we're operating with here. And accompanying this bedroom, there is another really gross bathroom where we'll find even more writing on the walls. Here we can see the words need Christina and dig written over and over again. Perhaps what this person is searching for isn't an insect or a treasure, but instead a loved one which is a really eerie thought. When we make our way towards the other hallway upstairs, we'll find several things of note. The first being a money cache that's stashed away in a nearby closet. And here we begin to see with our own eyes just how much money this operation is bringing in. On the whiteboard, we can see the totals of the profits being made. 250,000, 200,000, 125,000, 400,000, 300,000, 160,000, Suddenly, we can see why that witness tried to steal money from these guys. It's literally a bank vault sitting in a closet, and it's all right there for the taking. On the other wall, we can find a map of Los Suenos, where we can see the path of the city's drainage system. And here, it sort of becomes clear why these drug dealers and manufacturers are letting all of these junkies just hang around. They're fueling these people's delusions and drug addictions as a means to make them work for them. They plan to use these meth addicts as their labor force to dig into the city's drainage system, where they would then presumably use those tunnels as a way to smuggle drugs throughout the area. In the next room, we can find where these men have been storing their drugs, as there are shelfuls and shelfuls just filled to the brim with methamphetamine. This is where they must keep the finished product before sending it out to their dealers to sell on the streets. Next to this little room, we can see a whiteboard where it says, Los Locos rules. Pay your dues. No stealing. Don't tell anyone what we do and don't fuck around. Which, I mean, in terms of running a massive drug operation, seems to be some pretty typical rules there. <laughs> Anyways, after seeing this, we now know for certain that this operation is being run by the Los Locos, a gang which, as we'll find out later, has several connections to the cartel. In this room, we can also find some more scribbles on the wall, another bunch of creepy drawings, and a small security desk, which shows a camera feed from some of the security cameras around the property. On the wall, we can also see several printed photos, which are pictures of suspicious people that were caught on the security cameras. Once we clear this room, though, we can make our way further down the hallway, and here we'll find perhaps the most memorable part of this level, the child's room. 
Now this room is probably one of the first instances in the game that we see Ready or Not's famous rug pull that we've all grown accustomed to. You know the one point in all of the levels where there's that one super fucked up thing that we all remember? This is that. Now compared to the rest of the level, this room is a massive juxtaposition. While it isn't really a great room for a child by any means, it's still significantly better than the rest of the house. While most of the other rooms and hallways are poorly lit, this one has several different sources of illumination. The bedroom also has quite a lot of decorations in it, where the rest of the house seems very desolate and bare. As we look around, we can listen as a music box gently plays in the background. We learn the name of the child on the nearby wall as the name Molly is spelled out with wooden blocks. The more that we look around, the more that we see the room of a typical child. A jump rope sits on top of the little girl's desk, and stuffed animals can be found all over the room. Scattered across the floor are also several drawings. However, when we look at these, the room starts to take on a much darker complexion. In one of these drawings, we can see the depiction of a dinosaur with its eyes rolled back into its head, and vomit falling down its cheeks. Needles lay both in and around the character, and with that, it becomes obvious that this is a depiction of an overdose. The fact that a child of this age not only understands what an overdose is, but has also seen one is really troubling, and the thought gets even more disturbing when we see the next drawing where we can see a man with a knife approaching a woman sleeping in her bed. Which forces us to ask the question, did Molly witness a murder? After all, she's living in a house with meth addicts and drug dealers. The thought honestly isn't too out there. Next to Molly's bed, we can see a wheelchair. And when our eyes turn a bit further to the left, we can see the young girl lying in a bed, convulsing and choking up vomit. Next to her sits a used needle, and with that, we can now see that this girl isn't having a seizure or convulsing, she's overdosing. Someone in this house has come in and drugged her, which creates a really disturbing context because what reason would someone have for drugging a little girl lying in her own bed? I think I take back what I said earlier about this being a non-lethal run. Once we process this room though, we can make our way across a makeshift bridge into the second house. Now, in our briefing, we're told that this second house was in the process of being fumigated while a family went on vacation. However, this family, for one reason or another, never made it home. And not long after, these addicts began squatting in their house and called it their own. Now, after looking around a bit, we can quickly find out that this house is where most of the meth is actually being made, as we can see several cook stations littered throughout the home. And in all likelihood, this is probably a reference to Breaking Bad, as some of the characters there, for a good portion of the show, started cooking meth out of fumigated houses, sort of as a way of hiding in plain sight. Now, aside from the meth labs and some creepy drawings in this building, I didn't really find anything of note. So for now, we'll make our way back outside and up towards the only other building that we haven't investigated yet. When we make our way inside, we are immediately greeted with more of the dig writings painted all over the walls. We also see a diagram of the city's drainage system, but this time there's a drawing of the dug tunnels next to it. And once again, we can see depictions of a giant insect, said to be lurking somewhere in the tunnels below. So without further ado, I think it's finally time that we go and check these tunnels out. Now in this particular part of the map, it's really easy to get turned around in the dark. And it doesn't help that there's several armed men down here, so you really do need to be careful or risk having to restart the mission. Down here we'll find some more shovels, a wheelbarrow, a lit flare, some more creepy drawings, but never do we see any signs of this large insect. It's also worth noting that we never find signs of this Christina. There's no bed, there's no body, there's simply nothing. I went into these tunnels with the full expectation that there was going to be something absolutely horrific down there, and there never was. And to me, that just makes this level feel more depressing, because it goes to show that a lot of these addicts here are just being taken advantage of. They're being fed these lies that their loved ones or some creature might be lurking down in the tunnels below, and unbeknownst to them, they're just doing busy work for a drug cartel. It's really sad. 
It's even sadder though when you consider that young girl that we found upstairs. Her father is probably so strung out on drugs and tired searching for this Christina that he's completely blind to the assaults that have been committed on his daughter. And that's probably the happiest spin that I can put on that because the only real alternative there is that the father is willingly letting his underage daughter be assaulted by these monsters, which is a horrific thought. I think the twisted nerve is a really great depiction of addiction. It shows us the lengths that addicts will go to to feed their vices. It shows us the ways that they're taken advantage of, but most of all, it provides a sobering image of how this shit ruins people's lives. At the end of the day, you don't need a giant bug or a scary monster to make this level horrifying, because in reality, people are the scariest monster there is. With all of that being said though, thank you guys so much for watching today's video. You know I love you. I'm out.